India is one of the most fascinating countries in the world. Nothing comes close to Indian culture with the unpredictability of its bustling streets and the attack that it unleashes on the body's senses. While India leans towards third world poverty with its dirty and unsanitized streets, for all its faults, the country offers some of the most magnificent landscapes and architecture to be found anywhere in the world. Indian religion and culture is full of life. The people are friendly and it boasts some of the most romantic destinations in the world. Indian history dates back to 2500 BC, when inhabitants of the country were first recorded developing urban structures and participating in agricultural trade. The history of India is long and varied and includes the migration of tribes and the region being placed under the power of various dynasties. Agra is home to the Taj Mahal, making it India's most popular city. It is located near the river Yamuna, in the northern state of Uttar Pradesh, and is the most populated city in the state, with a population of more than 1.5 million people. While the city of Agra is famous for the heritage sites, it is also one of the most prominent centres of handicrafts, carpets and leather goods in the country. The Mughal were grand patrons of the arts and crafts, and the major handicraft items to be found there include embroidery work, brassware, jewellery and marble inlay work. Shopping in India is one of the most popular ways to experience the culture of the country, also giving visitors the chance to bring home a few keepsakes. Walking down the shopping street, the mosque on the left of the garden and Miman Khana on the right create a mirror-like symmetry of the mausoleum. The pool in front of the mosque functions as a place for ablutions before prayer. The grounds of both buildings are the same. Only the octagonal mihrab niches in the mosque are different. Three marble domes placed over platforms cover both buildings. The main entrances are decorated with multi-cusped blind arches. India underwent a significant change in the 10th and 11th centuries as Islam began to spread throughout the country. The Turkish and Afghanis invaded the country during this period as well, resulting in one of the most interesting periods in India's history, where the two dominating cultures of Hindu and Muslim influenced each other over several hundred years, blending together in some parts of the country. Still today, influences from one culture can be seen in the other. The best way to travel in Agra is in a tuk-tuk, or motorised three-wheeled cabined cycle, which is used for both private and public transport throughout India. Auto rickshaws, often simply called autos, provide a cheap and efficient mode of transportation. In India, cars dart everywhere and are often forced to brake sharply before buses full of passengers, carts, scooters, bicycles, tuk-tuks, and even cows who always seem completely unperturbed about the traffic frenzy. In India, history and magic, fascination and beauty live together with vital and original chaos.
The Taj Mahal is the jewel of Muslim art in India and one of the most universally admired masterpieces in the world's heritage. There is no doubt that the monument partially owes its fame to the moving circumstances that surrounded its construction. Shah Jahan built the Taj Mahal as a monument to the memory of his favorite wife, Mumtaz Mahal. The economy of the Agra district is principally agriculture-based, while the economy of Agra city is primarily small-scale industry, commerce and trade. Major crops include wheat, paddy, bajra, mustard and potato. Situated on the right bank of the Yamuna is a vast Mughal garden of some 17 hectares. This funerary monument, bounded by four isolated minarets, dominates the landscape of criss-crossed water channels, with its octagonal structure capped by a bulbous dome. The Indian subcontinent is a vast country with rich aquatic resources. It offers a variety of fishing opportunities in both its freshwater and brackish water environments. Most artisan fishing communities have developed elaborate traditions, legends and even religious rites, which enable them to culturally integrate with the ecology of the river on which they live. The Yamuna in northern India is the largest tributary river of the Ganges. In Hindu mythology, Yamuna is considered the most sacred of all rivers. It is said that Yamuna was the consort of Lord Sri Krishna. Gokula, the divine abode of the Lord, is the home of Yamuna. It is said that the river first went around Sri Krishna before descending down to earth as per the order of the Lord. The Taj Mahal, situated at the north end of the garden, rests on two bases. The square platform, with its black and white checkerboard design, is topped by a huge blue-veined white marble terrace. The platform is framed at the corners by four minarets. There are identical red sandstone buildings on both the east and west sides of the tomb. The Rausa, or central mausoleum structure, is square with beveled corners. Each corner is crowned with a small dome, while the main central double dome is topped with a brass finial. Both as a tribute to a beautiful woman and as a monument for enduring love, the Taj Mahal reveals its subtle beauties to the visitor slowly. The rectangular base of the Taj is in itself symbolic of the different sides from which to view a beautiful woman. The riverfront terrace, one of the most impressive platforms ever built, sits just one meter and 22 centimeters above the garden while towards the river the height reaches 8.7 metres due to the sloping terrain. The terrace was the first structure built within the Taj complex. The red sandstone facades of the terrace are decorated with carvings of flower vases and palm trees framed with white marble. The two riverfront doors near the towers, which once offered direct boat access to the Taj Mahal, are now closed. The terrace is geometrically covered with light and dark sandstone. At the corners of the pedestal stand four large minarets, each 40 metres tall, and the entire monument is symmetrical. Taj Mahal literally means the place of the crown, with Taj meaning crown and Mahal meaning place. Several myths exist about the Taj Mahal. One of these claims is that the structure is sinking and that in spite of all the precautions taken, cracks began appearing in the facade just four years after construction was completed. Another claim is that the monument is tilting towards the riverside. Another myth states that the Taj Mahal was originally decorated in precious jewels, such as diamonds, pearls and gold leaf, and that these were subsequently stolen.
The gate faces south towards the old town of Mumtazabad, modern-day Taj Ganj. This gate is for pedestrians. To the right of this gate is a red stone tomb crowned with a dome and surrounded by courtyards. This is said to be the grave of one of Mumtaj Mahal's lady companions and for this reason is known as the tomb of a maid of honor. The platform of the building is octagonal and the cupola is turnip shaped. To date, no accurate historical account of these graves has been given. Yet most historians agree that they most probably belong to the personal ward attendants of Mumtaz Mahal. Just opposite this building, there is a red stone edifice of the same type. The main entrance is framed in rectangular with surah from the Quran, namely daybreak, which invites believers into paradise. The red sandstone structure is surrounded by octagonal minarets, topped by white marble cornered domes. White marble is also used generously on the central arches, while the thin frames around the rectangular panels of the corner towers are only lined. The arch tops are decorated with floral patterns. The materials used in the construction of the Taj Mahal were brought in from all over India as well as from Central Asia. White Makrana marble came from Jodhpur. Precious stones for the inlay came from Baghdad, Punjab, Egypt, Russia, Golconda, China, Afghanistan, Ceylon, Persia, as well as the Indian Ocean. In the Taj Mahal, the tiered use of red sandstone and white marble contributes manifold symbolic significance. The Mughals elaborated on a concept whose roots can be traced to earlier Hindu practices, as was set out in the Vishnudha Motara Purana. Here it was recommended that white stone be used for buildings for the Brahmins, or priestly caste, while red stone should be used for buildings constructed for members of the Kshatriya's warrior caste. By building structures that employed such colour coding, the Mughals identified themselves with the two leading classes of Indian social structure and, in turn, defined themselves as rulers in Indian terms. Red sandstone also had significance in the Persian origins of the Mughal Empire, where red was the exclusive colour of imperial tents. Its symbolism is multifaceted on the one hand evoking a more perfect, stylized and permanent garden of paradise than could be found growing in the earthly garden. On the other, an instrument of propaganda for Jahan's chroniclers, who portrayed him as an erect cypress of the garden of the caliphate, and frequently used plant metaphors to praise his good governance, person, family and court. The walls are inscribed with Arabic verses from the Qur'an, written in black calligraphy. Islamic tradition dictates that the use of images, be them human or animal, is strictly prohibited, for risk of equalizing them with the figure of God. For this reason, Islamic calligraphy designs, mostly excerpts from the Qur'an, were used both inside and outside the pure white building as an important element of ornamentation. The building was also used to assert Yahani propaganda concerning the perfection of the Mughal leadership. Wayne Begley put forward an interpretation in 1979 that exploits the Islamic idea that the Garden of Paradise is also the location of the throne of God on the Day of Judgment. In his reading, the Taj Mahal is seen as a monument where Shah Jahan has symbolically appropriated the authority of the throne of God for the glorification of his own reign. Koch disagrees, finding this an overly elaborate explanation and pointing out that the throne or surah from the Quran is missing from the calligraphic inscriptions. The Jilao Khana complex is dominated by the great entrance gate set in the center of the southern wall of the funerary garden. Lahauri calls it Dawatsa Iradza, or the gate of the mausoleum, and it is indeed a worthy counterpart to the mausoleum. The monumental structure sets a formal ascent and mediates the transition between the area of the Jilaukana and the funerary garden. It prepares the visitor for the grandeur of the mausoleum that awaits within. The great gate is preceded on the south and north by platforms paved with geometric patterns. The south front of the great gate faces the Jilaukana as a splendid introduction to the imperial architecture of the domain of the mausoleum. Flanking the Dawadza Iraudza on the north, there are two double arcaded galleries of multi-foliate arches known as the Southern Galleries. 
one to the east and one to the west, overlook the large garden that precedes the main mausoleum. The columns of the outer and inner arcades differ only in the decoration of their bases, with the floral decoration of the outer ones alluding to the garden. The gallery platform extends into the garden with its patterned tiled pavement facing the garden. The galleries terminate in rooms on the east and west sides. The four-storied main gateway of the Taj Mahal is built in red sandstone. It is decorated with passages from the Holy Quran written in Arabic calligraphy, as well as with motifs of entwined flowers, leaves and spiralling vines hanging down the niches. These motifs have been realised in semi-precious stones inlaid into the white marble. Precious and semi-precious stones are used more extensively in the decoration of the mausoleum than elsewhere in the complex. These include lapis lazuli, sapphire, cornelian, jasper, chrysolite and heliotrope. A strict discipline in both the colours and patterns of the ornamentation can be observed. Floral leaf carvings are found on the marble and sandstone walls and are stylistically related to Pietra Dura work. The Taj Mahal is one of the most wonderful tourism destinations in India and is aptly considered one of the greatest wonders of the world. People all over the world desire to see the grandeur of the Taj Mahal, but only a lucky few get to see this marble wonder. The exquisite and highly skilled inlay work was developed by Mughal lapidarists from techniques learned from Italian craftsmen employed at the court. Images taken from European herbals or books illustrating botanical species were refined and adapted to Mughal inlay work. History obscures precisely who designed the Taj Mahal. In the Islamic world at that time, the credit for building design was usually given to its patron rather than its architects. Contemporary evidence makes it clear that a team of architects were responsible for the design and supervision of the works, but they are mentioned infrequently. A labour force of about 20,000 workers was recruited from across northern India. Sculptors from Bukhara, calligraphers from Syria and Persia, inlayers from southern India, stone cutters from Baluchistan, a specialist in building turrets and another who carved only marble flowers were part of the 37 men who formed the creative unit. Some of the builders involved in the construction of the Taj Mahal worked under the master supervision of Emperor Shah Jahan himself. It is also said that Shah Jahan cut off the hands of his sculptors and architects so that they would never again be able to build a monument as magnificent and as beautiful as the Taj Mahal. Other versions claim that he even had their eyes removed so that they would never be able to witness anything bigger or more beautiful than the monument that they had built in their lifetime. Like many other Mughal memorial tombs, the Taj Mahal was situated within a formal garden. The form of this garden referenced the Persian tradition of Shah Bagha, where a square wall encloses a garden divided equally into four. The Bagicha, or ornamental gardens, through which the paths lead, are designed in keeping with the classical Mughal Shah Bagha style. Two marble canals studded with fountains were lined with cypresses emanating from the centre. The paradise-like garden is one of the most impressive parts of the complex. The square garden is divided into four parts by two main walkways. 
Each of the four parts is further separated by narrower walkways into four further subdivisions. The entire Taj complex consisted of two components, each following the riverfront garden design, the Char Bagar and Terrace. A true riverfront garden and a landlocked variant in the configuration of two subsidiary units. The waterworks, which brought water to the Taj garden from the Yamuna by means of an arch-supported aqueduct, are situated outside the western wall and still preserve their original design. The eye-catching pure white marble platform has a square format enriched by four three-storey minarets crowned with the pillared domes of octagonal chatris. The vaulted tunnel stairs reach to the platform from the central riverfront terrace on the southern side. The remaining three sides open at the centre via two doors to a long room lit by a hexagonal patterned jalis or cage window. The rooms that were once used for the imperial family's resting place now function as storage space. The rigour of a perfect elevation of astonishing graphic purity is disguised and almost contradicted by the scintillation of a fairy-like decor where white marble, the main building material, accentuates the floral arabesques, the decorative bands and the calligraphic inscriptions encrusted in polychromatic pietra dura. During construction, a network of wells was laid along the river line to support the huge mausoleum buildings. Masons, stonecutters, inlayers, carvers, painters, calligraphers, dome builders and other artisans were requisitioned from across the empire, as well as from Central Asia and Iran. While the bricks used for internal construction were locally made, the white marble used for external veneering was produced from Makrana in Rajasthan. Semi-precious stones used for inlay ornamentation were bought from distant regions in India, Ceylon and Afghanistan. Red sandstone of varying tints was requisitioned from the neighbouring quarries of Sikri and Dolpur. The interplay between residential and funerary genres was a Mughal architectural characteristic from the beginning. In the Taj Mahal, the aim was to perfect the riverfront garden and enlarge it to a scale beyond the reach of ordinary mortals, to create here on earth, in the Mughal city, a paradise garden palace for the deceased. The influence of naturalism can easily be seen in the detailed carved decorations of the plinth. The pishtak halls above the plinth are ornamented with flowers raising up from the ground. Tulips, narcissus and smaller flowers are framed by pietra dura leaf motifs. Geometric yellow and black rectangular frames with eight-sided stars placed at the corners embellish the over plinth decoration facing the garden. The history of the Taj Mahal begins with the death of Emperor Shah Jahan's third and favourite wife, Mumtaz Mahal, who died after giving birth to the couple's 14th child. The Emperor was so stricken with grief that he decided to build a grand mausoleum in her honour. Here began the construction of the Taj Mahal. The first stone was laid in 1632 and it would take approximately 20 years to finish the project. Shah Jahan was the emperor of the Mughal Empire from 1628 to 1658. The empire was founded in 1526 and was the main power on the Indian subcontinent from the mid-1500s until the early 18th century. Shah Jahan married Mumtaz Mahal in 1612 and the two went on to enjoy a very intimate and intense relationship which produced 14 children, seven of whom survived beyond childbirth or early childhood. Coincidentally, the child born during Mumtaz's fatal childbirth, Guahara Begum, lived until the ripe age of 75. More than 20,000 labourers helped to build the Taj Mahal, and when completed, the famous structure presented a whole new level of refinement. 
The success of the Mughal Empire allowed for only the finest materials to be used, and to this day the mausoleum has little trouble impressing those who lay their eyes upon it. The four minarets standing at the corners of the mausoleum platform represent the stairs at the foot of the sky. The use of minarets dates back to the 17th century, probably coming from the influence of Ottoman architecture. The mosques of the Ottoman sultans were surrounded by minarets, with the number of minarets present signifying the rank of the mosque. Domes have a special significance in both Islamic and Hindu architecture. It is believed that the power and energy of a celestial presence can be felt by standing, in silence, under the center of the dome. The dome, with its hanging flower shape topped by a crescent, is positioned above the tomb chamber, while the four chartres are located above the octagonal corner rooms. The shape of the dome is emphasized by four smaller domed chartres, or kiosks, placed at its corners each replicating the onion shape of the main dome. The place was an important pilgrim destination, being the death place of Mumtaz, who died here in childbirth and was considered a martyr following Islamic traditions. The building style is primarily influenced by Central Asian and Persian architecture, as well as Muslim architecture. The construction took 22 years to complete using the power of 20,000 workers. Under the reign of Shah Jahan, the symbolic content of Mughal architecture reached its peak. Inspired by a verse written by the imperial goldsmith and poet Bibadal Khan, and in keeping with most Mughal funereal architecture, the Taj Mahal complex was conceived of as a replica on earth of the house of Mumtaz in paradise. This theme permeates the entire complex and informs the design and appearance of all its elements. A number of secondary principles were also employed, of which the concept of hierarchy is predominant. A deliberate interplay was established between the building's elements, its surface decoration, materials, geometric planning and its acoustics. This interplay extends from what can be physically seen and experienced with the senses into religious, intellectual, mathematical and poetic ideas. Mughal architecture was derived from a variety of different sources. It is often difficult to pinpoint the extent to which any particular Mughal design feature or building technique derives from any particular source, mainly due to the fact that early Indian Islamic architecture includes both Hindu and Islamic elements. Distinctive Hindu features that were incorporated into Mughal architecture include trabeated stone construction, richly ornamented carved piers and columns, and shallow arches made of corbels rather than voussoirs. In addition, there are particular elements typically associated with Hindu construction, such as the shatris, a domed kiosk that rests on a series of pillars. Persian influences in Mughal architecture include the extensive use of tile work, the use of domes, the iwan as a central mosque feature, the Shah Bagar, or four-way divided garden, and the four center point arch. Four marble-clad minarets flank the mausoleum, one at each corner of its plinth. Minarets did not become prevalent in Mughal building until the 17th century and can also be seen in the gateway of Akbar's tomb in Sikandra in Agra. Each of the Taj Mahal's minarets contains an internal winding staircase hewn of rough sandstone that provides access to the roof 
and boasts three projecting balconies, accessible by a door on each level. Each minaret is topped with a shatri, supported by slender columns and multicusped arches. Each shatri is capped with a kalasa finial. The minarets all have a slight outward tilt, believed to be a design measure intended to protect the main mausoleum structure from damage should a minaret collapse. One of the characteristic materials of Mughal architecture is hard, deep red sandstone. The strength of this material under compression renders it ideal for trabeated construction, where roofs are made of flat stone slabs supported by stone columns. Despite the strength and hardness of this stone, Indian masons, well trained in the Hindu tradition of ornate temple construction, were able to intricately carve this sandstone as can be seen in the detailed columns of the Jami Mashid in Delhi. White marble is the other type of stone often associated with Mughal architecture. It was originally used in conjunction with red sandstone as a cladding for the front of many monumental buildings, as evidenced at the tomb of Humayun in Delhi, where it was also used as an inlay and outline for the red sandstone pavement. Later, during the reign of Shah Jahan in the 17th century, White marble facing was used to cover entire buildings, the best known example of this being the Taj Mahal itself. In addition to the fine cut stone masonry used for facades, coarse rubble stone construction was used for the majority of walls. Baked brick was also used for some elements of the construction, such as the domes and arches, although these were usually covered with plaster or face stones. The Taj Mahal's listing as a World Heritage Site in 1982 resulted in a significant increase in the awareness of and concern for the monument. The main mausoleum itself, as well as the Taj complex in its entirety, are in a fairly good state of preservation. The history of repairs, restoration and other conservation activities that the structure has undergone reflects the myriad approaches, methods and practices attempted over a time span of about 350 years. The earliest reference to repairs made to the main mausoleum can be found in a letter dated 1652 AD from Al Rangzeb to his imperial father Shah Jahan where reference is made to cracks in the main dome, the four semi-domed portals, the four small domes, the four northern vestibules, and the seven arched underground chambers. Since then, the conservation of the Taj Mahal has been carried out on a fairly regular basis, even if the only available documentation of these repairs refers to the works undertaken after the arrival of the British. The first committee to oversee the repairs and maintenance of the Taj Mahal was established in the early 19th century by Lord Minto. Funds for this work were initially obtained through the sale of produce from the Taj Gardens, and later through income revenue appropriated from the villages attached to the Taj. Post-independence, the Archaeological Survey of India, or ASI, became the legal custodian of the Taj Mahal, responsible for the conservation and maintenance of the monument. The ASI, in its endeavour to preserve the monument, has had to tackle the problem of deterioration through natural causes. 
The nature of repairs that the ASI has carried out ranges from the replacement of massive worn-out marble slabs to the replacement of tiny inlay pieces vandalized by tourists. Sections of worn-out red sandstone have been replaced with new stone that matches the original in both color and carving. More than 1,200 bird species are found in India. This abundance can be attributed to the incredible variety of climate and habitat. Outside the Taj Mahal, a long entry path leads through a park that is crawling with monkeys. It has become a tourist pastime to bring or buy food to feed the monkeys with. Green parrots and other wild birds also find refuge in the park of the Taj Mahal. India has always been a popular destination for travellers. The culture, tradition and lifestyle of the common masses, together with the grandeur and opulence of the royalty, attracts people to explore and experience the real India. These characteristics, combined with the mysticism, spiritualism, yoga and Ayurveda, make India a must-visit destination on the world travel map. The splendour of the monument is undiminished by the crowds of tourists who visit it each day. The masses of people become as small and immaterial as ants in the face of this immense and captivating monument. It is said that the Taj is at its most attractive in the relative quiet of early morning, masked in mists and bathed with a soft red flame. The moment that its huge marble surfaces fall into shadow or reflect the sun, the colour of the structure changes from mild grey and yellow to pearly cream and brilliant white, making it a destination well worth visiting at different times of the day. Tourists can observe the magical time that is the first light of the sun, when the grounds of the Taj Mahal are almost deserted and the first rays of the morning light up the monument. During the afternoon, the Taj is a stunning spectacle of white, while in the evening, the Taj Mahal is dressed in the orange glow of the setting sun. The Taj Mahal is classed as one of the eight wonders of the world, with some Western historians claiming that its architectural beauty has never been surpassed. In 1983, the Taj Mahal became a UNESCO World Heritage Site and was cited as the jewel of Muslim art in India, a universally admired masterpiece of the world's heritage. <laughs> 